Welcome everyone. Uh, I am Dara Cosberg. I am the Senior Program Director at Reimagine, um, and we're so excited uh, to be with all of you today. Um, for those who are unfamiliar, uh, Reimagine is a nonprofit organization catalyzing a uniquely powerful community, people of different backgrounds, ages, races, sexual orientations, gender identities, and faiths, and people of no faith. Um, we all come together to heal ourselves, our communities, and the world, and we support each other in facing adversity, loss, and mortality to transform life's biggest challenges into action and growth. Um, Reimagined uh, resources, support groups, events like this one today are free and accessible to the public, and this is made possible because of the support and generosity of participants like yourselves. Um, so for those who already have made a tax deductible donation when you registered for today's program, thank you so much. Um, your gift will immediately support Reimagine's mission to help people of all walks of life transform the hard parts of life into purpose and meaning. Um, and uh, Nicole is dropping a link into um, the chat uh, for um, if you're interested in donating. Um, so Welcome to uh, The Long Goodbye, um, which is our theme for this month um, around anticipatory grief. Um, this is the final session of a three-part series uh, called The Long Goodbye, and I'm just going to advance my slides, um, and it's all about taking action. Um, so I'm glad that we're here today with Claire Bidwell-Smith and Darnell Lamont. Uh, Walker, um, and I'm going to be sharing a little bit more about them very soon. Um, a few weeks ago, we hosted a panel discussion about the expectation of loss and the grief that we experience before a death or an actual loss. Losses include not only the deaths of people, but also the effects of climate change in the natural world. Author, ec grief expert, widow, and cancer survivor, Lisa Kiefoffer moderated the discussion. Um, Kyle, Kyle Hill addressed how indigenous communities are coping with eco-anxiety and further losses of native, native land. Um, Jamie Thrower discussed how folks in queer communities navigate loss as they prepare to come out to biological family members who may reject um, them. And Dr. Quinn Galloway Salazar, a death doula who serves veterans, emphasized the importance of being present for families caring for a loved one in hospice. Um, and finally, uh, Maya Sachs um, shared how ritual, sorry, Myra Sachs shared how ritual is key to navigating anticipatory grief, in particular with her experience as a mother of a child with terminal illness. Um, last week's session was led by Jamie Morrison. Uh, she's a choreographer, educator, former caregiver, and widow. And our gathering was a movement workshop uh, for those anticipate, anticipate, oh God, anticipating um, loss. Jamie talked about the duality of emotions and experiences, living with sorrow and joy, living with absence and presence and living with loss and love. And she compared the experience of caregiving as time traveling. You reflect on the past, stay present and envision the future. Connecting with the body through movement can be a grounding experience as you travel across the multiverse of grief. Um, and as a reminder, we do have recordings of all of these on our YouTube channel, um, and which we can drop a link later um, and really recommend uh, you checking those out. So now I'm going to move um, over to today's session. Um, oops. Oh, uh, I guess. Um, well, OK, sorry, I, I was I mixed something up. But um, this is just a reminder about um, Zoom, um, how to use it, which I think you all do. Um, but um, we do recommend uh, keeping your camera on. Um, and uh, if you can, um, but no, no worries if you can't. Um, we will have a Q and A, so feel free to add um, comments and questions throughout the session uh, in the chat, um, and we'll try to get to as many of those as possible. Um, and if you um, do need closed captioning, you can click that on as well. Um, so I'm just going to get out of here for a second. Great. 
Um, so tonight is all about action, small, sweet steps to transform our anticipatory grief into growth, wisdom, or self-knowledge. And I'm very much looking forward to this conversation with Claire and Darnell. Um, so what the format for today's program is going to be is that Claire and Darnell will be in dialogue for 35 minutes. Um, and then that conversation will be followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. Um, and then you're going to have an opportunity to join peer-led breakout groups um, for about 15 minutes. Um, so, okay. Uh, I think that is all. So we are going to, oh, and I just wanted to note um, that if you have any technical issues during the session, please feel free to message me or my colleague, uh, Nicole. Um, and uh, and then also um, we will be recording parts of this program, not the um, breakout sessions, but the other parts um, and those will be available. You'll receive a link um, after the session. Um, great, so what I'm gonna do right now is hand things over to Claire and Darnell. And as a little intro, um, Claire Bidwell-Smith uh, is a therapist, author, and a longtime reimagined collabor collaborator. Um, her recent books include Anxiety, The Missing Stage of Grief, and Conscious Grieving, A Transformative Approach to Healing from Loss, which I highly recommend. Um, and uh, Nicole is dropping some links in right now. Um, and then Darnell Lamont Walker is an Emmy-nominated writer, documentary filmmaker, and death doula. Um, and you can find him at the links um, in the chat that are getting pasted. Um, so... I am uh, going to kick this off um, with a question and then have you both take it from here. Um, but it first, just in these times um, or in the past, how has anticipatory grief been showing up for you? So I'm just gonna leave it there and let you guys all take it away. Thank you, Dara. It's so nice to see everyone's beautiful faces here. Um, really happy to see you, Darnell, and excited to be doing something with Reimagine. Always really um, honored to be in this space with this organization. Darnell, do you want to share about um, your experiences with anticipatory grief first? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, like I'm getting my voice back, everyone. Um, I just had a great weekend uh, at a reunion. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, for me, uh, I am a death doula. And I'm also someone who, you know, like I shared last year at Inwell, I've, I've been living with a condition, uh, with a blood clot condition that I was told could kill me at any moment. Um, and so, you know, I live with the awareness that death could happen at any time, which is could be shocking. But for me, it's been like this great thing where I've been able to live a life that I've wanted to live. It's pushed me in that direction. Um, but from the death doula side, I work with clients um, from both sides, um, the clients who, you know, who are at the end of their life and as well as the families um, deal with enormous amounts of uh, anticipatory grief. Uh, where we're we're coming to the end um, of a thing, and we're not sure what's on the other side of that, um, and helping them to figure out how we're going to move toward it, what what steps we're going to take toward that, um, to maybe, you know, grief is um, we can't cure grief, um, but there are things we can do, um, things we've done that can help soften it in a way um in in many cases it's not always the case but in many cases we're able to soften that thing and so I, i'm able to work with these families and offer steps and offer advice and um things that have worked for other families and sometimes connect people to say hey and you know as a filmmaker that's a, a lot of what i've done um, a lot of the work that i do is to use the voice of others to um to amplify the voice of others so other folks can feel not so alone. Um, and in that, it's like we can also work through some of this grief that may be coming. Because when you realize you're not alone and there are other people who went through it, it's like, okay, you know, 
it, le- it can help lessen that anxiety around it. Um, death is unique in that we don't know what's on the other side of that. Um, you know, we have no idea, but um, everything leading up to it, folks have been through. And so that's where I come from um, with this work, um, at least the on the nose part of it all. Um, that's where I come from with it. I have so many questions, but uh, I'll, let me, I'll just give you my background to give all of you my background with anticipatory grief as well. Um, I, I started in pretty early in life with a lot of anticipatory grief. Both of my parents were diagnosed with cancer within months of each other when I was 14. And I spent a lot of the, my teen years while they were going in and out of treatments and diagnoses and I spent a lot of that time in denial that, that there was anything that was going to happen, that they were going to die. And a lot of that was due to the way that they handled it. You know, they didn't ever talk about death or dying. They didn't, we didn't have a lot of conversations about any of that. So I just kind of went on my way with my teenage years, paying attention to school and boys and things like that. And when my mother died, when I was 18, I was a college freshman, her death was really shocking to me, even though she had been sick for five years, even though, you know, we had been through so much in terms of her illness, her death was very abrupt and shocking to me in many ways. And the moment she died, the first, one of the first things I began to really think about was that I was going to lose my dad too. Um, For anyone who's been through a big loss, once you've been through it, you really oftentimes can become fearful of more loss because it's such a huge experience. The grief is so immense. Um, I think sometimes we find ourselves worrying that we'll lose other people and what that will be like. And I already knew my father was so much older and had cancer as well. And in fact, he did die seven years after my mom when I was 25, but I really spent those seven years steeped in anticipatory grief. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't in a good way. I mean, I'm, Tonight, I really want to make sure we talk about some some great tools and ways that anticipatory grief can be empowering and um, and there's positivity to be found in it. But for me, my early experience of it, it was really rough because I had no tools. I didn't have anyone guiding me through that. We did not have a death doula. My father, in some ways, um, he he really chose to embrace the end of his life in a way that was very different than the way my mother did. Um, my mom was just trying treatment after treatment up until the very last minute. And we never really kind of found any peace or had conversations that, that could have been had, but my dad wanted to die at home with hospice. He asked me to be his caregiver and I kind of went into it kicking and screaming. I just didn't want to lose him. I was so scared. I didn't know anybody my age who was going through anything like this. And he, um, it was like a really beautiful last act of parenting of kind of guiding me through his own death and asking me to show up for it. But I had a lot of anticipatory grief. And for me, it looked like a lot of anxiety, uh, a lot of fear, um, a lot of sadness and grief, but not grief that replaced or took the space of the grief that would also come later. Um, it was kind of its own beast. And in the years since I, you know, I've, I've, kind of turned all of this into my life's work, writing about grief and speaking about it and becoming a therapist who specializes in this. And um, I sit with people all the time who are either facing a death of a loved one, or they have just been through one and just kind of helping them untangle the grief process and, and, and find ways to sit in it. And I think, um, I think it's really helpful, like you said, to find others that you can connect with and feel seen and understood within that process. And I don't think any, any of us should ever fault ourselves for needing support as we go through this kind of stuff in life. These are big things, you know, losing people we love, facing terminal illnesses, facing all the other big changes that are going on in our world right now. It's tough. I tell my kids all the time, it is not easy to be human in the world. And I think we need to help each other do it. Um, so Darnell, what, um, when you, when you were first diagnosed with this blood clot, like what, did you have a lot of anxiety? How did you kind of come around to the place where you seem so Zen now in you're like, yeah, yeah, it could happen at any minute, living my best life. (laughs) (laughs) It's crazy. Yes. Uh, short answer. Uh, um, the long answer, um, I, I had never dealt with anything, you know, personally, uh, that big in my life where, you know, death was a, possibility um but since i was nine like my story of becoming a death doula um the short version of that is 
my family, my grandmother anyway, and my mother, we always talked about death. We talked about, you know, how she wanted to die, how her mother died, how death was handled in the family um, bef when my grandmother was a child. And but there was no one else she could talk to about it because the family didn't want to have those conversations. Um, and so it really it got me used to the conversation of death and death itself. And then at, at 13, just looking for something to do, I volunteered at a hospice in my hometown and I was always around death. So I, I, for me, I think, and I haven't even examined it that much. So I love this question um, because I don't get it often. But um, when it happened, it was um, more of a, you know, the doctor comes in and I, I think I thought I just pulled a muscle. And he says, uh, well, you have, he's like, how long have you been out of breath? I was like, oh, you know, about a month and a half. And he says, well, you should have died about a month and a half ago. There are three clots in your lungs and there are 16 that go from your ankle all the way up. And I'm thinking, oh, well, let's fix that. <laughs> and that was like, that was the, that was the thought. And I, and I thought, you know, maybe I should just get to this life that I've always wanted to, to lead. But I think I was halfway there anyway. And it was kind of like this push. Um, mm -hmm. So there wasn't much anxiety around it, but then I think a few years later, um, and when my son, um, so my son, who's now, he's in college now, but uh, he was young. He he wasn't born when I was diagnosed, but he was born shortly after. But when he turned about five and I thought, oh my gosh, I really want to be around. Mm. Then anxiety kicked in and it was like, okay, I have to stay, I have to stay alive long enough to, um, so that he can realize who I was. So he knows who I am, who I was, and I can share these stories that I have. Um, so there was anxiety around that. Um, there were nights when I just sit and think I couldn't sleep just thinking about it. So I started writing. I'm, I've, I've always been a writer, but I started writing these stories out. Like if this should happen, this is what I need him to know. Um, and so it came much later uh, and it was more so because of him. Um, and I, I'm sure that if I didn't have a child, it would be just a, oh yeah, I could die at any moment. That's fine. I'm gonna, just going to keep on. Mm -hmm. keep on going about this life you know yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. it sounds like though you know by writing about it and sitting up and thinking about it so much you kind of leaned into it which mm -hmm. I often find to be the answer right like we can slam the door on it yeah. over and over but that's not going to solve it and it's not going to make the anxiety go away so often I, I find myself really leaning into the things I fear the most to try to face them and in doing so it really helps me sit with them. You know, we can't cure the grief. We can't cure the inevitability of death, um, but we can just learn how to sit with it and hold it in different mm -hmm. ways. I love writing yeah. as well. That was always a tool for me. Um, Absolutely. And, it's, you know, and I love came to that. Yeah. yeah. And I love what you just said about, you know, leaning into it. It's, um, I think it's the way, like I, I spoke, I, well, I, last week I was at the uh, National Funeral Directors um, Association convention. And someone who who attended uh, my presentation said, uh, you know, the only way through grief is to grieve. And I thought, you know, yes, I, yeah, that does that's, that's that's it, you know. And I have friends. One who I had a um, friend currently who's going through deep grief um, after the loss of his husband, and but the the fear to lean into that grief is so real, you know. And and I have clients often who are so afraid to lean into it because we don't know how deep it's going to go. And, and understandably, because we have, you know, there are the thoughts of, well, I don't, I can't live without them. And what if I get to that thought where I don't want to live without them and I don't want, you know, to yeah. cause self-harm. Um, but it's so real and it's like, yes, let's lean into it, but where's the limit, you know? And so trying right. to find, trying to find that, trying to find that, um, uh, where's the, where's the border? Where can I, where do I have to stop? Yeah. And I think, you know, too, it's like I said earlier, like, I don't think we should have to do it alone, you know, like mm -hmm. let's lean into this scary stuff, but like find someone's hand to hold when you do it. You know, I think oh I hear goodness. from people Absolutely. all the time, like I'm, I'm afraid if I start crying, I'll never stop, or I'll just fall into this bottomless well of grief. So mm -hmm. find someone who can walk with you into it a little ways, you know, no one can take your grief and experience it for you, but they can be there with you in it. And I think that's such a beautiful mm -hmm. thing. 
absolutely. We're not we're not supposed to go through this alone. Mm-hmm. And I and there are people and all of us may not have the same situation, but I, you know, I've heard so many times, you know, as a death doula and just as a person, you know, uh so many times when someone dies or when grief is uh, you know, coming, when we know that it's it's imminent, there are people will call me, you know, reach out to me, you know, I'm here for you. And so many times we don't. And, you know, because that's hard too, <laughs> you know, it, that's hard mm-hmm. to reach out and say, and be the person to say, Hey, I'm hurting right now. I need a hug. I need this, but I, we have to, we have to be able to do that. We have to be able to have those hard, uh, to say those hard things, um, so that we aren't alone. Um, we're not supposed to grieve alone at all. No. no. So I, I think one of the big hallmarks of anticipatory grief is often anxiety. You know, if you think of someone, maybe kind of a classic example, who's a caregiver and they know that their person is going to die in the coming weeks, months, within the year, and the caregiving itself is exhausting and overwhelming. And then they're, they're thinking ahead of, of what this is going to be like when their person is gone. And I think there's so much anxiety in that space. Um, Day after day, you're not sure how much longer they'll be here, how much longer this potential caregiving experience can go on. And it's just so overwhelming and there's just so much anxiety. Um, I think we can get really lost in that space. And it's, it's that space where we just, it's a very liminal space and we just don't know what the future holds. We're thinking about the past and decisions we've made to get here. The day-to-day present Mm. is so overwhelming. How do you work with people who are in that space? And they're just kind of really paralyzed by so much of that anxiety. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's, um, a a large part of my process is figuring out who the person is um, that I'm working with and what what can work for them. Um, you know, in, in the beginning of this conversation, we talked about um, just the tasks and, and steps that can be taken um, to kind of work through that. And for some, you know, I think it always begins with acknowledging and allowing those emotions and giving ourselves permission to have those emotions. Mm-hmm. Um, so many times it, it just feels wrong to, to be anxious and have anxiety because, you know, society has made anxiety seem like, it, you know, it's not what anyone wants, but we have to acknowledge that first. Um, and so I, I make sure that we do that. I work with, with them through that. Um, recognizing and naming those emotions um, can sometimes make them more manageable. Um, mm-hmm. And once we admit to it, um, it's like, okay, now this is what it is. This is how I can handle it. Now that I know what it is, I know what steps I can take to kind of do this or who I can reach out to, but it can't start until we acknowledge that. Um, And then from there, it's, you know, there's so many things we can do. There's, uh, you know, practicing mindfulness, um, which we find there's, you know, there's meditation, there's yoga, of course. Um, And I think it's, you know, important to say that meditation looks like a lot of things. It's whatever allows us to focus, you know, like Mm -hmm. I, I can wash dishes and I'm meditating. I, I go for rides in my car and it's with no music. And it's just, you know, I, I once drove across country and I got to from Georgia. I think I got to Oklahoma when I, till I, when I realized I hadn't been playing music the whole time and my mind has just been focused, you know, and um, that's part of it. Um, seeking support. Again, we're not supposed to do this thing alone and, and support groups still exist. I, you know, I, and it's, it's, it sounds crazy, but, we and it's like I don't know if I want these people to I don't want to be that vulnerable just yet and that's fine um finding at least one other person to talk to um is is a is a big thing and you know my my favorite thing is like the free form of therapy which is is journaling um can sometimes it, it gets this stuff out it unblocks and uh removes some of those blocks that are in the way once we wake up and just get it on paper. Um, and again, you know, these aren't, these aren't the cure, um, but they help. Um, no, they really do. Have been, they're, they're, you know, they really do. Yeah. They're big things. You know, I think you, I think we often in many different kind of wellness and self-help spaces hear these things of like journaling, meditation, mindfulness, 
but for a reason, you know, and, and especially with anticipatory grief, these are the tools that really help us step out of that spiral that we can get into where we're just spiraling out, thinking about the future, worrying about the grief, worrying about the person being gone and just bringing yourself to the very present moment, you know, focusing on your breath, focusing on the temperature and the air, focusing on the sounds you hear can just take you out of that, that mind spiral that we can so often get into. And I think Mm -hmm. doing things to calm your body, just doing some really simple breathing exercises that will like calm your nervous system down when we're in that spiral of anxious thoughts where, you know, our whole nervous system is getting amped up. So doing some really simple things to calm Mm -hmm. the system down and writing is such an amazing tool for all of this as well. And I love that you said meditation can look like many things. You know, one of the things I like to say about meditation is, you know how, when you sit down and you're trying to just like meditate and get quiet and have no thoughts. And immediately there's like 10 thoughts. And then you're like, okay, no, I'm not going to pay attention to that thought about groceries. And I'm not going to pay attention to that thought about bills, but this is also, that's the goal of what we're talking about here. So when you're in this anxious, anticipatory grief space, when those scary thoughts come, like, what am I going to do without this person? What am I going to do when they're gone? Notice mm-hmm. that thought and let it go, you know, and just come yes. back to right now and in this present moment. Absolutely. And, you know, um, and even I always like to say, because there's so many times like when I'm working with um, a client who especially clients who choose to die at home. Right. Um, and there are family members around. A lot of times the family want they want to stay in the house and they want to be there and and they forget to go outside and outside is a world where that I, I try to remind them there's there's more than this dark room. And, you know, so, I, you know, I, let's go for a walk. Um, and so I just want to throw in, you know, walking is, is very helpful, even if it's just around the block or even if it's just stepping out on the porch and breathing in some fresh air. Absolutely. Um, but knowing that the outside world is out there um, can can really help. I love that. One thing I like to do too, is I'll come up with just like mantras that I'll just repeat because I'll Mm -hmm. find myself um, when I'm in a really kind of overwhelmed state, I'll realize I'm saying things to myself. Like I can't do this. I can't handle it. I can't, I can't do it. Like blah, blah, blah. And so I'll just start replacing those thoughts with like, I'm okay. I can do this. I'm safe. I'm loved. Mm -hmm. I don't have to believe that like half the time I don't believe those things, but I'll repeat those instead of the really scary stuff. And I find it really, it really changes things for me. Um, so, you know, write down, write down four things and just say them instead of the scary things. You don't have to believe them, but watch, there will be a shift. Like it's a fake it till you make it kind of thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, and adding in, you know, uh, you know, leaving, leaving room for joy you know so many times we we get into that that anxious space um or we're dealing with grief and it could feel guilt you could feel guilty for having these moments of joy that that still come um you know i'm i'm usually the friend I, i used to be the friend who would tell people before i really leaned into the work of a death doula but i was the friend who told who told friends like you know if someone dies don't call me unless you want to eat, unless you want to joke, unless you want me to pick you up to make you smile and laugh and have a, and take you out of that moment. Um, mm. And, and they would all call anyway. And then, and we would have, and I'd have these, these little pieces of joy. It would still be a hard day, but there would be small moments of joy to remind them like, you know, this life is still going. You can still give yourself permission to experience moments of happiness and lightness um, even amidst the grief, you know, um, I think that's important, you know, enjoying I life. Think that's, you know, yeah. kind of what you touched on too, when you spoke about you, your diagnosis and, um, I think grief and death are here to teach us so much and they ask so mm-hmm. much of us. And what you found in the, the question that was posed to you is what, what's the life I want to live? And it, and it enabled you to, seek out that life that you want to live, you know? So I think these things, end of life and grief really um, offer opportunities to figure out what's meaningful to us. What do we want life to be like? Who do we want to be? What do we want our relationships to be? 
And, and there's a lot of beauty in that. It's scary. It's totally fucking scary. Sorry. I don't know if I can swear, but <laughs> it's, um, I think it's, it's also a, an incredible opportunity, you know, when we do that, Darnell, what, what role do like ritual and ceremony and maybe spirituality play in, in grief and anticipatory grief for you? Yeah. So, um, for me, it's kind of, you know, having this thing when they're time, like, you know, anxiety, we can't control so much, so much of, you know, so much that grief sends our way. Um, and for those of us who sometimes need control of something, um, rituals really play a, a hand in that, um, you know, whether it's finding a day of the week to do this thing, you know, like I, I'm, I'm a writer, I'm a letter writer. I love writing letters. Um, and when those things come, my ritual is to, oh, you know what? I'm going to write a letter to that person, um, whether they're dead or alive. You know, I, I write letters to people who are living that they'll never receive them. I just love writing letters, you know? And, um, so it plays, a, it plays a big part, uh, spirituality, um, plays a part, especially when I'm, I'm dealing with, um, my own, my own grief. Um, but, um, when I'm working with clients, there are times when, like I had one client who he wanted to die. He wasn't very connected to his spirituality or his, his um, family spirituality at all. I mean, I shared this story last week and he wanted to die. His mother was from <clears throat> a small, small region of the Philippines, um, where, as someone, as the person was dying, they'd come and they'd chant songs, they'd say prayers, um, and we were able to bring some of his family in to do that for him. Um, and it kind of reconnected him to the family, it reconnected him to his mother's heritage, um, and this thing that he'd long forgotten um, through his life. And you could see, and, and that was this moment of joy because his mom had passed on mm. um, many years ago. And so it, it reconnected him through that. Um, and as a person who's seen death, you know, it's just a beautiful thing to be able to give, um, someone the death that they, that they asked for, um, or get as close to it as possible. Um, and so rituals, spirituality, they play, they all play a hand in that and, and getting into it. And even the bonding part that we, that was mentioned in the beginning of this conversation, um, it's, it's, it's huge in that. Um, and, and, and doing these rituals, you can bring other people in. I've, I've, you know, been able to engage my family members in writing these letters as well. Um, where we, we also meet up on, um, my grandmother on the day, she, on, on her birthday and the day she died, you know, we try to have conversations at least, but hopefully meet up for a picnic or, you know, family reunion. Um, so all, all all the ways. I think it's extremely important um, for anyone, you know, whether the person died 30 years ago um, or is someone on their deathbed now. Um, I think it's yeah. extremely important. Mm -hmm. I love that. I think you said something at the very beginning. I can't remember what it was, but about ritual, it's like, it's something you can do and have control over. And I think there's an intentionality that comes with ritual that can give us, you know, a little bit more of a sense of feeling empowered in our, in our process and in our grief and our experience. And I love that, you know, with rituals, you don't have to have any particular faith or any faith at all. It, it's just, it's a way to, to get intentional with what's happening. And it's a way to tune into yourself and it's a way to kind of explore the process. I've always loved writing too. I write a lot of letters, love writing letters to dead people. And um, it's amazing. It's, it is. it's such it's an incredible. amazing thing, you know, like, uh, and, and, the first one could kind of be, it could be a little strange. You're not sure what to do. And I actually put a template on my Instagram a few weeks ago because I was like, you know, other people should do this. A friend said, what can I, you know, he's like, I miss my mom. What, what could I do? You know, I wish I could talk to her. I was like, well, you can Yeah. write a letter. And I was like, well, what? And this person is not a writer at all. He's like, well, what do I put in the letter? And I was like, oh, maybe I should create a template maybe for that first letter. And it's like, hey, this is what I, this is what's been happening, you know, since you left. This is, I feel this is what you would say to me. And, and in those letters, you, you remember their voice and you remember who they were and what they'd say to you in these times. And it's like, oh, yeah, right mm -hmm. on. You know, I still remember that. 
Um, letters and with the act of writing, you like can't help but imagine how they would receive it, how they would hear it. So it really mm-hmm. feels like you're in communication with them in a really special way. Um, 100%. For the Q&A, mm-hmm. I just want to ask you one last question. Um, how, how, how do you, what advice do you give for someone who's maybe supporting someone who's in this kind of anticipatory grieving situation? It sounds like you have lots of fun activities. Um, how do you support someone? I, I think so many of us struggle when we see loved ones struggling. You know, if I have a friend who's caring for a dying mm-hmm. loved one, it's hard. It's hard for me to sit with that and, and I want to fix it. I want to make them feel better, but we can't always do that. But how, how can we support them? Oh, yeah, God. you know, um, oh, you're fine. <laughs> um, the, the, it's funny. I, I remember when I got to college and I was a speech communications major and I had to take a class uh, called Effective Listening. And I thought this would be the, of course, everyone listens. This is the easiest class I'll get today. And got in there and realized that no one listens. <laughs> no one listens. And it it changed my life. That class changed my life. And um, now that I do this work, I, I realize that the most important thing I can do in this work and the most important thing we can do to support anyone going through grief or anything uh, in their life is to listen. Um, that's the short. The long one is, you know, people, when they are experiencing grief, when someone dies, they don't know what they want, but we can still sit there, hold space for them, be there for them. If it's, I'm just, okay, I know you don't know what you need, um, but we know our friends. It's like, okay, I, I know you don't know what you need, but I know you need to eat. You haven't eaten in days. Here's some food. Um, yeah. You know, here's some water. Let's walk. Let's take a walk outside. You haven't been outside in a long time. Um, and sometimes this is just me sitting on the end of the couch for five days and you haven't spoken to me, but I'm here. And when you need to talk, I'm here, you know, um, but just listening and and the answer may or may not appear, but we are there and we're holding the space. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah I mean, that's, that's yeah. really the, the the biggest thing. It's just to listen and to not, you know, again, people don't know what they want a lot of times because they're, they're in it and they're, everything is cloudy and they don't know. And so yeah. not trying to pull it out of them, but just being there, holding the space and listening. Yeah, absolutely. Not trying to fix anything. Not you don't even have to yeah. have all the answers. You just have to be there. Yeah. yeah. Just have to be there. Yeah. Beautiful. Dara, are we doing QA? Um, um, would you like me? I can read the um, sure. question so far. So this is from Kayla. Um, and th- thank you so much uh for this conversation. And um yeah, Dar- Darnell, feel free to. Um, I don't, I don't know, Nicole, maybe we can keep Darnell, um, spotlighted for now. Just, um, so, uh, I am a, and, and Claire, let's see. um, I am a therapist who works with, uh, people with cancer. There's so much grief in the process from lost body parts, lost vitality and anticipatory grief. However, many of my clients do not want to go there. Um, there's a belief that focusing on mortality will bring death to them. I want to honor their desire to align with hope and positive and a positive vision for the future, but I also want to help them process the grief that is obviously present. Do you have any guidance for how to best support these people? I'm going to let you start with that, Darnell, because I think this is the work you're doing pretty often. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I work in, um, I work with a lot of families um, and a lot of people who don't want to talk about death. Uh, it's bad luck. It's, uh, you know, they, they weren't raised to talk about it. Um, folks in my own family and, and it is tough. I, I, I remind them though of people. We, a lot of us know people who've died and families have fallen apart. Um, you know, we haven't planned for it. We haven't, we don't know what they want. We don't know where the papers are. We don't know where, any of this is. So I tell them that planning and preparing and having these conversations is what love sometimes looks like, you know, um, it, it helps us, you know, while we're grieving, we also don't have to do A, B, C, D, and E before we get to the grief. Um, we can just, it's already there. Um, and so 
I, I just lead them in that direction. My dad's one of those people who, you know, doesn't go, I don't, he doesn't go to hospitals. He doesn't want to talk about death. He doesn't do it. But now we are having conversations about it because I've convinced him that, you know, talking about it looks like love to me um, and to his, uh, his other kids and um, to the family. Um, yeah, that's where, that's where I start with it. And finding the way in, the finding the way in is, is, yeah. is hard when i go to people who are at the end it's it's easier because more people are ready to talk and they want to tell you how they want to go and they they've you know so many people have accepted it by then um but when when it's, the end is not near it is it is tough so finding that that thing um and there there are great tools to use now you know you have um the end of life deck that you know people are creating resources you know that are helping people have these harder conversations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a tough, it's a tough area. I, of course, what popped into my head was something I heard a Lua Arthur say once was that talking about sex does not get you pregnant and talking about death does not make you dead. <laughs> that always made me laugh. Um, <laughs> not that helpful though, uh, in this <laughs> exact question, but uh, but it's true. There's, a, I think there's a lot of superstition and fear, you know, and people do want to be positive. And I think you're right about, you've got to find that way in and also help people maybe reframe it for them and, and talk about some of the positive aspects of, of what it means to let yourself open up to these bigger questions and some of the fears that may come in these conversations and how there is an opportunity for more agency and feeling more empowered and and that it can be a gift to your loved ones if you can have some more of these conversations and really kind of sort through those end of life matters. You know, I really wish my mom had been able to talk about the end of her life. It would have been, I think, really healing for both of us. And I think it would have been really helpful in my grief process. And I'm grateful to my father for that. Um, so there are a lot of great resources out there for it too. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to ask a question from Kathy. Um, my grief journey has been going on since August, 2020. What I experience now is holding on maybe too tight to those who I expect to lose next. How would you advise folks doing the same? Hmm. Holding on too tight. I mean, I think, um, there is a fine balance, right? Like I think when we become really acquainted with death and grief, it does make us want to hold on tight. Um, and I think finding that balance of really soaking up as much life as you can, but not clinging into the anxiety and the fear of it. Um, but how you do that, I think is different for every single person finding some pieces of your life that are really fulfilling and meaningful, maybe exploring different realms of spirituality or religion, some framework with which to understand. I had a lot of fear of loss for many years. And especially when I became a mom, I was so afraid of losing my kids, losing my partner. Um, and I had to really kind of tap into some different pieces of myself and, and create a different framework to understand what we're doing here. And it's something I'm retooling all the time and kind of, it's like a practice, a spiritual practice in a lot of ways. Um, but I had to kind of learn on how to learn how to let go while holding on, if that makes sense. What about you, Darnell? What do you think? I I, I think that's perfect. Uh, I think, you know, the learning how to let go while holding on is very important. I think learning to let go is so it's, it's, it's huge. Um, but also, you know, like you said, finding that, finding whatever is going to help you understand it. Um, and, and, using it as as uh, a time to bond and a time to um you know pour love into someone but again not holding on to the you know clean like or leaning into the anxiety or <clears throat> the anxiety part of it it's um you know using the time to ask the questions that you've always wanted to have to to start talking about the preparation and and the end you know one of the first questions i always ask is how how would you like to die and that's how I, that's how I go right on in there. And, and then we, you know, and I always say, we're going to get to the joy part, but we got to get through this hard part first. But if you promise, if you can promise me to get through this, I promise we'll get to the joy. Um, so using it for that, for um, those occasions. Absolutely. I love that. Um, I have a question from Cora. 
So as it turned out, when I open up the conversation, I learned that people around me are going through their own grief and they have worse situations. Although they're offering, if you want to talk, blah, blah, blah. How can we support each other? Yeah. Um, uh, Lisa, who came and spoke before, we, you know, was mentioned in the beginning. I, I love when she talks about, um, you know, you we we don't have to compare grief. You know, we can just get together and and talk. It's like I don't, I want to talk to this person, but I've only lost, you know, my dog, and she lost her mom. What can I do? It's like, yeah, but you know, you know what you needed in that moment, mm -hmm. and you know who you needed in that moment, and what you wish someone would have done or what you wish someone would have said. So approach that way. And and again, it's all about listening. Um, and you know, knowing that you're not here to fix it. You're not here to cure anyone of it. It's just, I'm here to be a support system for you. Um, like, I hope you can be a support system for me. Um, yeah, it's, it, I think it's, I think that's the best way to approach that. I love that. Um, and uh, Anne just asked the question was, what is the end of life deck Darnell referred to? Is that the, I think somebody put a link in for the death deck. Yeah. Is that, okay. Yeah. Once, hold on one. I got the card deck ready. Sure. Okay. So here we are. <laughs> um, so it looks like this. It's just a deck of cards. Um, and inside it's just a bunch of, you know, uh, questions you can, oh, can't really see it, but just a bunch of questions you can sit around and ask family members and they're fun. Uh, some are fun, funny. Um, and it's a way to get to know your friends, your family, your loved ones. Um, and it's a great way to start the conversation um, in a way that's not so heavy, not so, not, you know, um, and you could find one in there to uh, match the person that you're talking with. Great. Okay. I think the sooner we have these conversations with people about death and dying, the better, you know, like you always asking people, how do you want to die? I'm always asking people, what do you think happens when we die? And I just love mm -hmm. that conversation. <laughs> I love the not knowing. Yeah. I love the experiences people had, the, the you know, thoughts and mm -hmm. I don't know, beliefs that people carry. I, w I went around asking everybody that question for like five years at one point. And it was so fun. And I felt like, you know, we need to have this conversation more often. It gets all of us more comfortable with it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, one of my favorite questions is, you know, what, what's if hearing is the last to go, what song do you want to hear? What song do you want played as you're, as you're going out? You know, and people like music really pulls us back to a time, to, to a person, to people. Um, and everyone usually has an answer. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Um, just a question from somebody who is on a, a terminal path and uh, they're curious if um, you think that by preparing the family for it and then committing suicide is preferable or worse for the family than going through the extended death process. It's a big question. Um, I think it's different for everybody. You know, I think it's really, really layered. I think the person who um, is facing the end of life can feel really solid and peaceful about choices they make and the family will still maybe not, you know, I've, I've counseled a lot of people in grief who knew that their person felt really comfortable and peaceful with the choice they made, but then it's still been a difficult grief process for them. So I'm not always sure you can make everybody happy. I think it's a, I think it's a very personal thing that you have to wade into for yourself and really think through, um, it's, but it's, it's, you know, I think it's just so individual and I think it's a, I think it's a space that we're all really still exploring very early culturally. Um, so I think a lot of people have very old thoughts and ideas and feelings around it that we run up against. Darnell, what do you think? Do you see this in your work? Yeah. Um, not, not often, but, um, twice I have. And, um, like you said, it's very different for for everyone. Um, I have a, you know, I've had clients who were working with physicians who specialize in medical aid and dying. Um, and the family, in one case, the family was, in both cases, the families were very prepared and conversations were happening. 
But in one case, the family decided they didn't want to be there when it happened. And in one case, they did want to be there. Um, and in one case, they supported it and the other they didn't. Um, and so it's it's very case by case. Um, you know, but the conversation, the con I think the important part is the preparation and, and wanting to start that conversation also and um, wanting to prepare them for that. Um, you know, that's a that's a that's a start. And mm -hmm. but, you know, like you said, Claire, we we're at the beginning of it. You know, it wasn't long ago when it was very taboo. And now it's we we're able to have conversations and there are states that are, you know, allowing it. And it's, you know, thankfully. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, OK, I'm going to ask um, we're, I'm going to try to fit in as many questions in the next uh, few minutes. Um, so we have a question from Bree. Um, what comes to mind as common mistakes people make when trying to support someone dying, someone caring for a dying person? Hmm. Yeah, go for it. I think just the, the common mistake always in these cases with grief and with dying is just trying to fix it, trying to make it better, trying to make it rosy, trying to make it okay. Um, and a lot of times it's not okay. It's scary. It's painful. Um, there's so many different aspects of it. And so it just goes back to what we've been talking about, you know, that really just being there, listening, um, not trying to fix, not trying to have that kind of toxic positivity going into any of these cases with curiosity and compassion and openness and um, a desire to just show up with your full self, and not be afraid to of what it's going to bring up for you. Um, I think death and dying and grief always bring up our own grief, even if we're just adjacent to the experience of what's happening. Um, and just being open to that too, feeling your own stuff that comes up and acknowledging that for yourself is important. Yeah, I think that, that I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> I think that's, that's exactly it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a question from Theo. Um, how to respond to family, friends, and even grief workers who want me and others to center spirituality or religion in our others' grief practice or end-of-life plan. I see a lot of people assume that spirituality must be a part of the grief process. Anything can be a ritual. Any act can have meaning. Yeah, no, yeah. I don't think spirituality or religion ever have to be part of it. Um, I think they can be useful for some people. I think there are some people who um, can really find a lot of catharsis and framework and um, healing in those spaces, but they're not for everyone. I think that we can we can find just as many uh, beautiful tools and and ways to understand and process that don't have anything to do with spirituality or religion. Writing a letter to a dead loved person doesn't they? You don't have to believe in anything. You don't you don't have to believe that they'll ever hear it or see it. You're doing that for yourself. That's something you're doing to process and feel connected. Um, there's, there's so many ways we can do that. And I, I think, I think it's important to let people know that those, if those tools are, or if those spaces are not ones that, um, feel aligned with your process, then you should let people know that because no one should be pushed into those. Exactly. And just show up as you show up who you are, you know, they, the, your loved one, whoever it is, if it's your loved one or if, it, or if it's you, um, they know who you are and, they don't expect any anything different. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think this will be our final question. Um, this is from Kara. Uh, what supports you um, to be in community as we experience the failing of systems, televised genocide, climate disaster, et cetera, the anticipatory grief of the tremendous world changes feels overwhelming in these times? What was the first part? Like what inspires us to still what, be in community in light or of what thing? supports you to be in community as we experience? Like, so I maybe uh, for me, maybe I don't know. I still believe in humanity in spite of like all the insanity that is going on in our world. And I think there's a lot of really scary, sad stuff happening in our world right now. And it can, I think it can be easy to get a little lost in having faith in, in humanity, but I think you can also walk outside of your front door and like, just look into someone's eyes and talk to someone and interact with someone or be with a loved one and just find mm -hmm. so much beauty in humanity. I don't know. I really think there's still so much to support us coming together and working together and trying to resolve 
all kinds of things. Yeah. And I mean, I have a, I have a lot of proof in my life, my own life that most of the world is still a great place that most of the people are still good people and they are just bad people in it. Um, but also, you know, um, self-care there, I, I practice an enormous amount of self-care and, um, that's, you know, even on the days when it's hard, it's tough. It's like, I need to do one thing that, that, you know, feels good. And sometimes it's the, the best thing I do that day is journal like four sentences, you know, but, um, that's, that's what supports me, um, in my, um, in me wanting to keep going. Love that. Well, uh, we're going to move over to our breakout groups in a moment. And I'm so sorry for those uh, who I wasn't able to ask your questions. Um, but uh, thank you, Darnell. And thank you, Claire, for really um, a very enlightening um, conversation for me. I you know, have been in this world for quite some time and uh, I was hearing new things and uh, just reflecting on this particular really differently. So thank you. Um, I imagine for holding space for all of this and all of us. Yeah, thank you so uh, much. Yeah. Um, so I know that Claire um, needs to take off before the, the we go into breakout groups. I don't know if Darnell, you, you can hang out for another 15 minutes, but um, we are going to... Uh, uh, go into small groups of three to four people for just um, about 15 minutes. And um, the only thing that we ask is that uh, for um, those who opt for breakout rooms that you we request a minimum of audio participation with a preference for audio with video. Um, for those who do not wish to verbally participate uh, in breakout rooms, just uh, we ask that you stay in the main room. Um, I'll be in here. Um, and then please be mindful of the time and make sure that everyone has a chance to share. This is not about giving advice to others. It's just about active listening and sharing your own experience. And as Darnell shared, really the most important thing is to listen. Um, we will paste instructions in the chat now for those who need help while in breakout rooms. Um, again, I'll be in here. So if you ever need to leave the breakout room, um, and, uh, then, um, we'll come back together for a little Q and a, um, so I believe, um, let's see. And, um, yeah. And I think, uh, what we'll do, um, for, uh, let's see. Um, so for the props or sorry, the prompts, um, and this is a little, um, call out to Claire, which was um, these prompts were inspired by her book, uh, Conscious Grieving and the framework she developed in it. Um, so the questions that you all are gonna talk about are how are you staying present and taking care of yourself as you in navigate anticipatory grief? And what steps can you take to carry your grief with intention in order to continue to grow, heal and thrive? Um, and so, um, we'll be in there for, um, about 15 minutes. And so, uh, you know, each of you will have about three minutes, um, two to three minutes, uh, to share and, um, you know, you can use the time as you'd like. Um, and I am going to set up the breakout rooms. Um, uh, and if anybody has any questions, feel free to put it in the chat. Welcome back, everyone. Um, I I know that we are almost at time, but I do want to just see if anybody had any reflections they wanted, just brief reflections that they wanted to share from the chat, whether just like how the experience was or any kind of insights that, that came up and, you know, just kind of speaking, um, you know, for yourself. And I will, um, if you want to just use the little reaction and raise your hand. Okay, I see, I, Taquani, I'm so sorry if I am mispronouncing your name. You should be able to unmute now. I, I, 
Uh, yeah, um, um, absolutely, you did not say it wrong. Most people do. Um, it is Sekwani. Um, it, um, it means leopard in my indigenous language. I'm the Wat, um, Mexica native. And um, I just had a very beautiful, it, I've, had, like, I've experienced sort of grief of a, a person who's alive as well as my own mortality because I have an autoimmune disease that's pretty rapidly progressing. I mean, I still have a decade to go, but um, it was a beautiful experience to have someone who can understand my culture. And we were able to have, I think it's just a moment, a beautiful, miraculous moment of where we're both trying to figure out how do we maintain our joy or how do we share joy without feeling guilty for being joy, joyful? And I think a lot of communities of color often feel very, um, because we're often told we're too loud, we're too this, we're too this, that we find it to be disingenuous to share our joy with those that are dying. And so to be able to sort of come together and like the common theme was finding joy and finding community in this conversation, it was a beautiful moment for me. And I do feel truly, truly honored that it, I think it was Morgan, I believe that was their name, um, was on the chat with us. And I do apologize to the other person left. I hope they didn't feel like maybe because it was too loud in the restaurant, but it was just a beautiful moment. And I really, I honor the space that they held for me. So oh, thank you so much um, for sharing that. And I, um, I'll just reflect personally that as you know somebody who's experienced a fair amount of loss throughout my life and and grief that what I found was that if you wait for joy there's never going to be time so it's like kind of it's like you have to create it and it and it's um it's well, an act the one of the things like I I'm I'm Appalachian and Afro-Mexican but my Appalachian is very Mormon and so there is sort of this binary that exists within Mormon funerals and celebrations of life and like I absolutely know that I don't want a Mormon funeral I want a celebration of life I want people to be singing I want people to be partying I want people to remember that while I was here I tore shit up so like it was beautiful to have someone ask me how I'm experiencing joy even though like I'm my life is going to be shortened and being someone of color it's never felt wrong to celebrate and really celebrate someone who lived with that much vociferousness. Like, and we forget that we're not allowed, like we are allowed to experience joy, even in grief. So. Thank you. Yeah, That's beautiful so. what you're saying. That's beautiful. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, okay, uh, K Kathy. Oh, wait. Kathy, are you here? She's muted. I see her talking. She's muted. I, oh, wait, wait. Oh, I, took wait. It, I took it off, but then it came back on, okay. I guess. Okay. You're back. Okay. Um, thank you to Frank and Sheila. We also had a really lovely group, and Joy was part of it as well. Um, it really resonated for me how Frank shared that embracing what he's going through has allowed him to find some joyful moments too that he might not have seen or he may have missed if he wasn't going through what he is going through and then he's also in the chat he put a link in there uh dying living coexisting i think it is frank and that's um he had a great statement about those are not two separate things. <laughs> they are very connected and it's a seamless process. And once we begin to realize that, we can find the joy in it too. So I am very grateful for that. Thank you so much for sharing, Kathy. Um, and let's, I'll, I'll do Lonnie and then uh, Tanya, um, and then we should probably uh, wrap it up. Um, but uh, Lonnie, can you, are you unmuted? Yeah, now? I'm on, I think I'm unmuted. Am I unmuted? Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I never heard that uh, what was just referenced about dying, living, but one of the comments that I did make was like, we are all constantly dying and living. Like, that's life. Like, nobody isn't dying who is alive. You know, it, it's kind of that is the process. But I, I wanted to share that um, one of the things I, I did have a friend who was dying of cancer, and she had a funeral, not a funeral, a funeral. And in her last stages of death, 
Um, and she was in another state. I knew her from back in New York. This was in 10. She had written to many, many people that we all knew each other, like, and had a, she said, I don't want people coming to my funeral when I'm not there to say goodbye and see them. And I thought that was such a beautiful thing. And I had, I personally had been, you know, with her at other times through this process, but there were many that we knew together from years and years gone by and all being, they, they, you know, they came and actually the news station came because it was in a park. She had like a lot, I mean, she was in really, you know, laying down and weak and that was so beautiful. Um, and I, I don't know, it was just the first time I'd ever even thought of that in terms of, of planning for one's death. And it gave me some thoughts about it. I have other thoughts and plans and things, but, um, I just thought I'd share that here because perhaps someone may, uh, you know, may benefit or consider or, yeah. So, so much for sharing, Lonnie. Yeah. Um, okay, and uh, Tanya should be able to. Hey, everybody. Um, I am really glad that I. Um, made it to this event. I am, um, I've been a deaf doula for only two years and um, I haven't had the experiences that a, a lot of deaf doulas that have been doing this for a long time have had. But the few experiences that I've had um, have really humbled me. Um, being a person of color, coming from a background, a family that didn't talk about deaf, even when death was imminent or death was happening. It was just something that we dealt with, we pushed through and we move on. And that was not something that I wanted to continue for my own children. And when I started realizing that it was a big deficit in uh, especially the communities, um, of color where it was just like so taboo to talk about this. I really wanted to get in there and start making talking about death a norm because the more you talk about something, the less of an impact it starts to have. And for me, talking about death, how, albeit strange to some people, really helps me to sit in it and cope with anticipatory grief, past grief, grief that's happening right at the moment. And I think workshops like this are really needed um, just across the border because grief has so many layers, just like we are all so different here. And in our small breakout group, we talked about grief of you know, a mom who's losing a foster child and then grief of losing someone that you love and Canada even if you've only been with the person for a little while, it still hurts because in that little while you've, you've built something. So I just appreciate uh, being here for this workshop. Thank you so much for sharing Tanya and thank you for being here. And really thank you all for, um, I'm just so happy like 45 people stayed um, for the breakout groups. Um, Cause sometimes it's like, people are like, ah, I don't want to talk to strangers, but I have to say it's often one of the, the best parts of these experiences. And um, I also just want to thank Darnell and Claire for kind of setting this whole up, thing up and opening up their hearts and sharing their wisdom, which I think really um, helped uh, cultivate what magic and sharing happened in the groups. Um, Tequani, do you have just like a brief... Uh, <laughs> Yes, I just wanted to make two, like not interjections, but just uh, uh, piggyback off what the person said previous about the funeral and things like that. And also like the, the acceptance of like being able to both. Like I think especially, and then to piggyback off what the last young lady said, is that like, especially marginalized communities, there is this, even in Christian communities, there's a weird flex to me that we don't hold space for vulnerability and forget that if we are coming from a spiritual or Christian practice, that the like in order for us to truly pass through those gates of judgment, we have to be vulnerable. We have to 
allow ourselves to understand that there's nothing that we can do like to be like we are all worthy we're all worthy and I think especially within like I'm Afro-Mexican and so the trope of the strong black woman or the strong Latin woman it, it, it kind of gives us like it doesn't allow us the full spectrum of our humanity and the thing is the thing that I love most about being able to be vulnerable and cry is seeing how sometimes it, it discomforts people but then I can have a little bit of a giggle in it. And they're like, oh, you, you good? And I'm like, yeah, I'm good. Let's all cry together. Let's, let's do this together. Let's not like feel fear in this grief. Let's, let's empower ourselves to be able to feel the dialectism of this, like that is both, you know? And I, I really resonate with that, that we don't often give ourselves room to cry in front of people who we're worried that we're gonna be judged for not being strong enough. Thank you, Tiffany. Well, thank you for sharing. Um, I know that I'm so sorry, Andy, who normally <laughs> does these events. I think he's more timely than I am. So thank you all for holding on. Um, I just wanted to just uh, briefly call out the chats that were or, or the links that my colleague Nicole just put in the chat um, that just to remind you that, um, you know, we are able to have these free, accessible, engaging events because of the support from all of you. Um, and uh, if you're moved to make a donation, um, there's a link. And then also um, we have a survey link um, and we'd love to hear from you about what works well, what can be improved. Um, and then um, lastly, I want to say, um, join us uh, in November for the whole world in our hands, which is a three part series on collective grief, war, terror, racism, natural disaster, the pandemic, environmental injustice and mass shootings. They all adversely uh, affect us directly or indirectly via news and social media. How do we resist emotional numbing when collective tragedies occur again and again? How do we remain hopeful? Um, and this definitely alludes back to that question that was asked earlier. Um, mental health professionals, spiritual leaders, healers, activists, and advocates will explore how creative expression, acts of service, and spirituality can help us navigate a pathway forward. Um, and the link is in the chat. And I just wanted to call out Darnell, no pressure at all. But if you had any like last thoughts, I, I, I would love to hear your voice. Um, yeah. Um, and yeah, no, I, I, this has been absolutely amazing. Um, you know, even picked up some things that I have never uh, thought about doing. Um, shout out to Crystal, who was in my group. Um, who talked about writing, um, having a journal where she wrote letters to her grandmother, who's no longer with us, um, you know, just through, throughout uh, many different moments in her life. Um, and uh, shout out to uh, Nancy as well uh, for being a part of that group. Uh, I think we had a great discussion. I just want to thank everyone here uh, for being a part of that. Um, and I look forward to um, using these in, in the work that I continue doing. And please, and reach out, if, use me as a resource um, for anything um, to everyone here. Um, I had a great time. Thank you. And I'll just, um, I'm looking for your contact info, which all for you and Claire, I'll just repaste in the chat um, so people know where to find you. But um, I hope everyone has a wonderful evening, wherever you are. And again, thank you so much for making this such a special event.